Um, this is a new event series that we're doing at the Bangor Daily News, uh, trying to tackle some big topics in uh, small settings. And my name is Matt Yoker. I'm the Bangor Daily News Assistant Editorial Editor. Um, I work on the editorial board. And uh, we, are, we are focusing on four issues uh, this year, 2019, uh, one of them being climate change, uh, workforce development, cost of rural living, and we're also looking at a referendum reform here in the state as well. But so we're, this, we're sort of using climate change as a, as a jumping off point today to talk about environmental action and whether or not it can make sense for businesses. And I think, spoiler alert, I think you're going to hear tonight that it can. Um, but I just want to point out, you probably all met uh, Kimberly Scholes as well, our event coordinator. Uh, Joellen Easton, our uh, audience director, and uh, Robert Easton is uh, running Tech Force, and uh, our uh, very talented photographer, Linda, Linda Okresik, over there. Um, and also, big thank you to Cheryl uh, and West Market Square Artists and Coffee House for hosting us today. Uh, hopefully, you guys have all gotten some beverages and some food, uh, but she'll be back there if you need her. Um, but yeah, so again, we're just trying to you know work on this issue, just have a conversation today about you know. What are the in the business incentives and maybe even imperatives for environmental action? Um, and we're lucky to have a great panel here. Let's say we have Kristen Porter, who is a longtime cutler fisherman, and he is the new head of the Maine Lobster Business Association. How long have you been uh, in that role? Uh, about a year and a half. Okay, so not new. We're not new at all. Um, <laughs> but um, going to have some uh, some great insights for us on uh, on the lobster industry. Uh, and we have Brad Ryan from Epic Sports here in Bangor, uh, here to talk about uh, the nexus of environmental issues and the outdoor industry. Uh, we also have Abe Firth from Orno Brewing Company. Abe is a co-owner of several businesses here in the Bangor and Orno area, uh, and he's a member of this new initiative with uh, the Natural Resources Council of Maine called the Maine Brew Shed Alliance. Um, so Abe's going to talk to us about the importance of clean water in the brewing industry and maybe some, some other uh, environmental causes that his businesses are involved in. And last but not least, we have Kristen Jackson. So we have two Kristens on the panel. Kristen, <laughs> Kristen Jackson, the uh, Outreach Coordinator for the Natural Resources Council of Maine, who's going to talk about how her, um, her organization engages with uh, members of the business community for you know, shared goals in terms of environmental and, and economic action. So I think I'm going to turn it over to her now. Uh, she's going to talk a little bit about those efforts. Then we're going to ask some questions from the panel. And uh, after about 15 minutes or so, we'll turn up to questions from all of you. That's, we're hoping most of this event will be uh, you know, a discussion with all of us in this room. So we're going, to, we're going to kind of set the stage here with a little bit of conversation and then turn it over to you guys. So. Sure. Yeah, thanks, Matt. So like you said, my name is Kristen. I work with the Natural Resources Council of Maine. Um, so we are the state's largest environmental advocacy group. Um, we have been around since 1959, um, and actually just this past Tuesday was our 60th birthday, which is very exciting. Um, and we work on a whole host of issues uh, across the environmental uh, spectrum, mostly focused in the state house, um, and just came off one of the most successful legislative sessions uh, in the past 20 years for the environment, so lots to celebrate there. Um, but throughout our, our 60 year history, we've worked and partnered with the business community on you know, a whole bunch of different issues, everything from climate change to protecting public lands to protecting clean water, um, all of which we see as really integral to the Maine brand um, and to Maine as, as it is. Um, you know, we're known for our forests and our waterways and our fisheries and um, our outdoor recreation opportunities. And so all of that, I think, contributes to not only having a healthy environment, but a healthy economy. And so I think not only main people, but main businesses um, really recognize that our economy and our environment are, are intertwined and, and can't really be, be separated from each other. Um, so I'll tell you just about three, really quickly, about three different ways we've engaged the business community, but then turn it over to these folks who um, can actually talk about the, what they've done um, as, as business uh, leaders. Um, but the first I'll mention is what Matt uh, sort of teed up was forming the main Brewshed Alliance, which Abe and Orno Brewing were founding members of. Um, and so this is a coalition of breweries in Maine that are committed to protecting clean water. Um, we just launched back in March, but the idea is we'll engage um, in advocacy, so having the brewery members uh, speak up about clean water policies that are active. Um, we'll also engage in education and outreach, so talking to our customers and members about the importance of clean water, um, and then also in fundraising, so raising money for, for various clean water initiatives. 
Um, and we started with 13 brewery members, and since we launched in March, we're now up to around 35. And um, you know, through through the outreach that I, I did to help start this alliance, uh, we didn't have one single person say no. Right? I was really surprised by. Uh, how engaged, the, maybe not surprised, because that sounds like I wasn't expecting it, which I don't think is true. Uh, but you know, the whole brewing community was really uh, welcoming of the idea of this initiative, not only because clean water is you know, their, their number one ingredient and in what they need for their bottom line, but way, way beyond just the economic impact and again recognizing that clean water is so imperative to our way of life here in Maine, whether it's the health of Maine people or uh, our recreation opportunities um, or, you know, yeah, beyond just the economic imperative. Um, so that's one example, and Abe will probably talk a little bit more about that. Um, but another example uh, that I believe Brad was involved in, Epic Sports, was working to form the Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument, which happened at the end of the Obama administ administration in 2016. Um, and so we were trying really hard to get uh, that piece of land to be protected for all of Mainers to enjoy and the entire country. Um, and so we're looking for ways to advocate for that land. Um, and one of the things that we found really influential was um, in 2015, we got over 200 businesses in the Bangor region, so Epic Sports was on that letter, um, and in the Katahdin region to um, send to the Department of Interior to support the National Monument. Um, and so that letter uh, was really influential in, in getting the Maine's congressional delegation to speak out for the monument, um, as well as the Department of Interior. Um, and then the last example uh, is we've done a ton of work over the past few decades to get businesses involved in climate action, which again was the, the sort of spur for this whole conversation. Um, that started, in, you'll see in 2010, we did a letter to the Maine's congressional delegation urging for positive action on climate that over 500 businesses signed in Maine. Um, and so that was big businesses like Lady Wellhan that I'm sure y'all would recognize all the way down to like your mom and pop acupuncturist on, <laughs> on Main Street or whatever it might be. That's just one of, that stands out in my mind. Uh, but so tons of businesses calling for climate action. Some of them calling because again, it would impact their their businesses, but again, just um, many of them because of the moral imperative of protecting our environment, um, not only because of the economy, but because it's it's what makes, um, protecting the environment is what makes Maine, um, Maine. Um, and so I'm happy to talk more about any of those initiatives or, or elaborate more on our climate stuff, but I think y'all probably want to hear from these guys, so I'll turn it over to them. Yeah, I'd like to start with A, just because, I mean, the, the idea for this event actually happened when we got the information of, about the Bruce Alliance, Alliance, and we thought, oh, that's a very interesting idea. So, interested to hear from you, you know, was it an easy decision to, to sign up for that alliance, and can you talk a little bit about why clean water is so important for your business? Sure. Uh, so, Maine is a place where we've really gained a national reputation for having great beer. We're really excited to be part of that. There's over 100 breweries in the state, and our water quality in Maine is a big reason why we have such great beer here. So it was a very natural fit. Uh, we feel that we have the responsibility based on the fact that we use so much water, and that our product 100% relies on the fact that that water stays quality water. Um, but also we want to be good neighbors, and um, we feel that we are able to have a voice um, that can go statewide through things like the, uh, the beer we made. That we, we, we did an Earth Day beer called Love Your Planet. There was a collab with Foundation down in Portland, and um, that told the story of you know, what we're doing with um, the Man Brewshed Alliance, and uh, we were able to raise a little bit of money for uh, the Man Brewshed Alliance and for the National Resources Council. So it's just a great way for us to kind of work together to uh, spread awareness and to help protect the resource that we feel is uh, imperative to our business, but also to why we're in Maine. Uh, my parents moved here from out of state before I was born because Maine's a beautiful place and they wanted to enjoy it. They live about, uh, they lived about 10 minutes from, from uh, Lobsterman over here, and, uh, down, the, down the coast in down East Maine, and um, they lived uh, in a little log cabin without electricity or running water because they were really very extremely into environmentalism and into low impact living. So 
early on in my life, I got to you know have the joy of um, you know, having a, a, a well, not a well, just this natural spring be our water source and just fill in buckets, and that's where our water was. Uh, now I live in a home in Orno that I just turn the faucet on. So um, you know, I've always kind of had a uh, you know things have changed over years based on that early experience to living in like a you know, modern with, with, with a shower and you know, a toilet and that kind of stuff. But uh, you know, um, it's definitely something that brought my family here, uh, the, the, the beauty of Maine, and the, um, the, I think it's important for all of us to, to appreciate that perspective. Yeah, but Brad, you were very, you were pretty vocal in your support of the National Monument and its creation. Um, why did you decide to jump into that issue so full throat? Well, uh, when the, the whole effort to create a national monument started, uh, it seemed like, besides being the, the right thing to do, but it also seemed like uh, no one from the state level, with the exception of Angus King, was really interested in getting behind the effort. Um, and so if they're not going to, then somebody has to. And we, we quickly learned that there were a lot of lot of other people that really wanted to see it happen. So it uh, it wasn't a difficult decision at all to, to really get behind that effort. And have you seen any change to your business volume since the money has been created? Well, uh, I'd like to be able to say, oh yes, you know, just you know, huge percentages. Um, so that, that wouldn't be really uh, terribly honest, but. Uh, just in the, the last two years, the number of people that have come through our doors and said, gee, you know, can you tell me about the National Monument, or do you have a map, or how do you get there? Um, and uh, it just led to really easy conversations about what it, what it was about, where it was, um, and uh, no, you can't get there in 15 minutes, and no, it's not Acadia, but not yet. Uh, but that's, that's soon to come. No, don't let it <laughs> Let me rephrase that. <laughs> no, it is really a gem, and if anyone hasn't been there yet, it's uh, it's a great place. Um, in preparing for this event, Kristen, I was taking a look at your uh, Twitter page. Oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> didn't see anything. Didn't see anything bad. <laughs> uh, but I did. I, I couldn't help but notice your bio, and I'm gonna I'm gonna read a quote from it. Go It says, "I work hard to catch fish and to make sure my kids will be able to catch fish too." So can you talk a little bit about that sort of generational imperative within the, the lobstering industry to protect your resource? Yep. And, what, you know, get yep. and, and I can give it as, as far as the lobstering industry and the fishing industry as a whole. Um, just everybody, I mean, it's in this business, most, most it's generational. Small communities have been working on the water and they want to make sure that, that their kids and their, you know, friends' kids can, can still make a living. So, you know, the, the, the things that especially the lobster industry has done for 50 or 60 years is to have our regulations so that there will always be something there. And we're, we're you know, throwing back the small ones, throwing back the big ones, just working in the middle. We do skate vents and we do you know, things so that we, we are not, we're not doing the fate of other industries, other fisheries that, that didn't do those things and are collapsed or in the process of rebuilding. And obviously, um, climate and just some of the demises of the other fisheries have helped us tremendously. So we're we're kind of reaping the benefits of a changing environment. Is there a point where those could cease being benefits? And yeah, um, it's it's a ways off, but yes, there's. Um, there, there's a tipping point of, you know, right now we're in what we call a sweet spot of ocean temperature in the Gulf of Maine where it's what lobsters like to, to reproduce and the, the, the small lobsters this big like and, and also when they, when they settle onto the bottom, their main predators, the ground fish, aren't there anymore. And we had an urchin fishery. Urchin fishery has kind of gone downhill, so all the kelp that they used to eat has grown up. So that's protective cover for the, those baby lobsters and that. So we're kind of, you know, because of some of the other things that happened, we're in that, you know, things are going in the right direction. For us. Uh, other than some of the external things around lobster, but the lobster and the resource itself is a pretty good issue. 
Now, can you explain a little bit, you know, you talk about that sh sort of shifting sweet spot. Mm -hmm. I think there's this narrative of lobsters moving north. Yeah. Um, you know, is this like a family of lobsters packing up their bags, saying, hey, honey, we're heading up to the coast? Or are they